Dr. Dune. Ontogeny. 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 Blue is cheap. Ontogeny. Dur dur dur.
I present to you the top 10 weirdest looking dinosaurs. Uh, I want to state the obvious and tell you that I'm going to be butchering the names of these dinosaurs. Butchering the names of these dinosaurs. In 1856, the fossilized teeth of a small dinosaur were discovered in Montana. The species was aptly named Troodon, which means wounded teeth. Troodon. Troodon. When evolution passed out the stealth gene, Troodons lucked out. This drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. Troodon was every inch the predator, with razor sharp serrated teeth and large hook like claws. Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. Troodon may have posed a greater threat to mammals than any other predator on Earth. The Troodon was suddenly cut down in its prime. <laughs> Dune. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's so good to have all of you here today. Happy Wednesday to you. We're going to have a fun stream. As you could probably guess, I'm starting late today because I'm going to be going late today with Belint from Science Streams. We're going to be doing our, uh, our weekly <laughs> scientist crossover chat. Discussing some new scientific papers from the realm of paleontology and arthropod science, entomology. And holy cow, Jody Fish. It is going toward the Partner Plus push. Holy cow, Jody Fish, and thank you so much for the 22 months of support. Newly up to Tier 3. That is extraordinary, Jody Fish, and I really appreciate it. As you may have seen, chat, well, here, I'll get to that in a minute. Let's not jump the gun here. First, let me say, thank you, everybody, for being here. Holy cow, especially if you might be new. Welcome to Paleontologizer. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Now, you probably know already. Ugh. You probably know already that uh, a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. You know, a scientist who studies fossils, not a fossilized scientist. I'm not, I'm not fossilized, you know. Someday, inshallah, perhaps. That's not today. As a, a paleontologist, I study fossils. I study dinosaur fossils in particular. Dinosaurs are what I dig up, what I excavate, you know, what I publish on in the scientific literature. And nowadays, dinosaurs are what I talk about five days a week right here on Twitch. Thank you, thank you, Niffler, for those 100 bits. I do really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Um, I do this full time, believe it or not. Uh, I've been remarkably fortunate to be able to, uh, to do science outreach as my full time gig, thanks to this platform, thanks to Twitch, and thanks to all of you wonderful viewers. And California Burbs, what an appropriate, 
What an appropriate alert there. Thank you so much for the 21 Paleo months. Birds are dinos, one Paleo birds are dinos, two Paleo birds are dinosaurs. Three for 21 months. And they have been for far longer than 21 months. Holy cow, California birds. Thank you for your, uh, your support for these past 21 months. Man, birds have been dinosaurs since they evolved from dinosaurs. About 160 million years ago. Give or take. We don't know exactly when it was. Sometime in the, like, middle or late Jurassic. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, California Burbs, I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you for everything you do. And how have the Burbs been lately? Good, I hope. We are getting some rain here. In the usually sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Doesn't look like this right now. What does it actually look like? Let's see here. Uh, this is the current view of the San Francisco Bay overcast in the Berkeley Hills. Can't even see the Golden Gate Bridge nor San Francisco in the distance. Can barely see Berkeley and Emeryville. Um, but yeah, yeah, and it's raining where I am right now, which is nice. We can use the rain. Uh, anyway. Good stuff. And... Uh, overcast in San Francisco? I know, right? Wait, why are people saying derp and... And color faded? What? Um, oh, you have high winds there where you are, Claire Burr, up north. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Strom coming in, says Miss Yvette. <laughs> there is a storm coming in right now, I think. Um, yeah, let's look at a, uh, let's look at a map here. Wonder Map from, uh, Wonderground.com. Come on. Radar. How do I make this? How do I big in this? Uh, whatever. Um, but we are having a wind advisory, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, the San Francisco Bay socked in with, uh, with clouds for the most part. Yellow, I guess, is like precipitation or thicker clouds. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, I don't know. I'm glad to be inside right now. Went out for a nice walk earlier, went to the post office, nothing there. Went grocery shopping for Ios and Lordi because they're both feeling under the weather. Um, yeah, and now I'm back, and, uh, ready to talk about some fossil news, do some Q&A, do some Metazoa in five minutes, and then do a crossover stream with Belint. And Victarius, thank you, thank you, for those two gift subs right there, Victarius. Excellent. Victorious gifted Victorious a subscription. Thank you, thank you, Victarius. Uh... Daner Beam and Chronic Sonic each got a gift sub thanks to your generosity there, Victarious. And look, we are swiftly approaching our goal for this week. No expense. And Cephalon Wolf, thank you for that gift sub. That is excellent. Thank you, thank you, Cephalon Wolf. Good stuff. Yeah. Um. Most extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. Savalo, thank you for the follow. Welcome. Welcome. And, uh... Makatu, thank you for the follow as well. And thank you, Niffler, for those 100 bits. That is excellent. I had an appointment with my therapist today. I was telling her about the stream in Metazoa. She told me I'm adorably nerdy. She's going to try it too. That's awesome, Niffler. That's awesome. Yeah, Metazoa is, uh... Metazoa, I should say. Metazoa is, you know, animals. That's the clade that's all animals. Metazoa? I guess they wanted to throw a zoo in it. It's the animal game. On the Lara Dragon. Thank you for those 29 months. I really appreciate that, Kalara Dragon. No expense. Thank you, Lenina, for that gift sub. That is excellent, Lenina, and I really appreciate it. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Sculpin, for those 100 bits. Splendid. Look, 
We are approaching a, uh, a level three hype train here. Not too shabby. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway, thank you, Galara Dragon. And that's, uh... I'm, I'm flattered, Niffler, that, that you brought up this screen during, uh, during therapy. That's excellent. Uh, I myself have gone to talk ther therapy before. Um, it can be really helpful, especially when you're going through stuff. There have been times in my life when I really needed that. Um, it's important, you know? It's important. Um... And Claire Burr, you go get some rest or whatever you need to do, Claire, but thank you for being here. Appreciate you. Have a good rest of your day, Claire. Yeah. And... True. Interesting, now. I don't know what that is, but... You know, if you... Uh, if you talk to Ios or Lordy, they'd be able to tell you whether the cats would like that. They are really the keeper of the cats. And the cats are really uh, the keeper of me. <laughs> um, it's like cat yogurt. Oh, nice, but meat flavor. Wow, I definitely would not like that. But I'm sure at least two of the cats would really like it. Yeah. I appreciate you thinking of, of them, Mel. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Danny is just staff in the cat's eyes, it's true. And uh, Murph has made a dinosaur deep dive request right now for Chindosaurus. Ooh. We should cover that. Chindosaurus is a really interesting one. And it's changed a lot in recent years. Um, so yeah, we can get into that. And maybe today we catch up on our dinosaur deep dives. Because we've got a few other ones from the past couple streams that we didn't get to. So, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But Metazoa is going to be updating in just a minute here, so uh, why don't we get into that? There we go. Metazoa. New game will start in zero hours, zero minutes. Well, well, well. That sounds like right now. And Dinosaur Dave, we didn't do your Dinosaur Deep Dive yet. No Dinosaur Dave, Dinosaur Deep Dive yet. We'll have to do that. What, what, what is it again, Dinosaur Dave? Was it Kunbarasaurus and, and Minmi? Or Minmai, rather. Anyway. And how many of the 1,500 dinosaur species are over-specified? Maybe as many as half. Le Petit Prince? It could be a lot. Also, there's more than 1,500 dinosaur species that have been named, but yeah. Um, anyway. Why don't we get into Metazoa here real quick? This is our animal guessing game. Hold on to your butts. And we'll see how few guesses we can get it in today. Our mystery animal. Give me the name of a placental mammal, chat. A placental mammal. Hedgehog, Steely Dan. Quick on the draw, okay. Hedgehog, let's do that. And it is a Laurasia theory. This was, oh man, that was an excellent one right off the bat there, Steely Dan. Yeah. So not only is it a placental mammal, but it's also a Boroeutherian mammal and a Laurasia theer. So let me show you what that means. Let's go to the mammals. Uh, there we go. We've got mammals. Um, our creature is not a monotreme. It's not a marsupial, but it is a therian mammal. It is a placental mammal, it is a Boroeutherian mammal, and it is a Laurasia theer. So. We've already managed to narrow it down from 1.4 million animals down to just 20, uh, 20 hundred, 2,000. Um, we can narrow it down even further because since Metazoa gives us the most exclusive clade that includes both our guests and the mystery animal of the day. Theria. We can tell that it is not going to be within Insectivora. It appears. Or, uh... Eulipotyphla, rather. Um, it's not going to be 
Eulipotyphlin. Like a hedgehog like that. Which means it's gotta be part of this group, which I'm not actually sure what this clade is called. Um, does this clade have a name? Let's look this up real quick, because it's not showing it here. Let's look at bats, and then we'll go up from there. Um, Mammalia scrotifera. Scrotifera is the name of this clade, it seems. Which includes our bats, our ungulates, our carnivorans, and our perissodactyls. Well, perissodactyls are kind of ungulate. Yeah, scrotifera. Um, that's, uh, okay. I guess that's where that name comes from, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I guess they've got external genitalia, the males do. So yeah, it's going to be one of these critters. So what we can try and do is let's use process of elimination for our second guess. Let's figure out if it's a carnivoran. That gives the history of life its very quirky, fortuitous, chancy character. We are Team literally Matrix. here only because of the good fortune of dinosaur extinction. I do it. Uh, I am only here thanks to the good fortune of your generous support, Team Matrix past seven months with those primes. I appreciate you, T-Matrix. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Uh, chat, I was about to ask you, or maybe did just ask you for a carnivoran. And, uh, Nell says, try a cat. Jody Fish says, hyena. Golden X says, pine martin. I like the sound of pine martin, but I'm not sure it's gonna be on here. Let's see. Pine martin. They don't have pine martin. They don't have Martins at all. So let's try Hyena, which is a cat-like carnivoran. Let's see if that gets us any closer there, Jody Fish. And it didn't. Uh-oh. Well, this still helps us a lot. So we can be sure that our critter is not a carnivoran. It could still be an ungulate, like a perissodactyl or an artiodactyl. Or it could be a bat. Um, give me the name of a hoofed mammal, chat. Give me the name of an artiodactyl or, or perissodactyl. Chen says moose. Linnaeus says bison. Let's do moose. Because I had moose seconded there. Ooh, oh boy. Oh boy. It is an artiodactyl. Artiodactyls are the even toed ungulates. So they're hoofed mammals that have. An even number of toes, either two, or four, or in the case of whales, zero. Um, yeah, yeah, but we can use this to our advantage because, you know, this is an artiodactyl. The cloven hoofed ungulates. And we guessed moose. Alces Alces is the... Uh, American Moose. Where are they on here? Yeah, AKA Eurasian Elk. Oh, Alsis Americanus, I guess it's the American Moose, sorry. Alsis Alsis is the Eurasian Elk, that's so funny. I look at that and I go, that, you know, that's not an elk, that's a, that's a moose, but what we call elk, people in Europe would call red deer. And what we call moose, we as Americans, Europeans would call elk. Uh, at the end of the day, they're all deer. Not Americans and Europeans, but uh, these animals are all deer. Uh, they're part of the deer family. Cervidae. Yep, cervidae. Deer, moose, and more. So, we know it's not a cervid, or it would have said cervidae. It doesn't. It says artiodactyla. So Gotta zoom out further. But we know it's not a cervid. And it's probably not this clade either, whatever that is called. Hmm. It could be a whale. Give me the name of some kind of a cetacean, chat. Some kind of whale. A whale or a dolphin or a porpoise. Um, orca. 
Thank you, Nell. Thank you. Oh boy, that didn't get us any closer. It's some other kind of artiodactyl. It's not a whale, and not a moose. The adult. Ontogeny. <laughs> Amelia Bedelia, thank you for the 23 months of support. I really appreciate it, Amelia. I do, I do. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I'm getting some other guesses. Boar and giraffe. Those are good guesses. Let's try and... Let's try and be as smart as we can about this. So we know it's some kind of artiodactyl. It's a member of this clade right here. Well, Cetariodactyl also includes whales. Um, there is still a chance it could be a camel or some sort of camelid. There's not very many species of them, but it could be a camel. It could also be a suid, like a pig, like a boar. And this gets tricky. This gets tricky. Um, it could also be a hippo. There are lots and lots of possibilities here. So, moose and orca are both flanking this critter. Uh, I kind of want to try. I kind of want to try camel. Ho 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 Okay, okay. We're on the right track. We are on the right track. It is some member of Camelidae, the camel family. That was a lucky guess on my part. Uh, excellent. Camels, llamas, and relatives. So it could be an alpaca or a vicuña. I already typed in camel, so it's probably not going to be that. It could be a llama. Let's see how many of these they actually have. They don't have Vicuña. They don't have Guanaco. They do have Llama. And they do have Alpaca. Oh boy. Um, let's try Llama. There's like a 50-50 shot it's a Llama. It's either a Llama or an Alpaca, I think. Um, so... Hold on to your butts. Let's try llama. No, it's not a llama. Which means it's got to be an alpaca. We just, oh man. We just squandered our guess. I should have listened to Jody Fish right there and Golganek. Let's try alpaca. Hold on to your butts. And that was it. Where's our pop-up that says that we won? Huh? There's supposed to be a little pop-up that says that we won. This happened to you too, Roman Grubbeard? It's interesting. There's no way to share it? It's... Oh boy. Oh boy. Hmm. And the same for you too? Let's try refreshing. Oh no. It's a bug. It is a bug, it would appear. I hope we still get credit for this one. Hmm. Well, it's an alpaca. Yeah. A bug? No, that's a mammal. There you go, Nell. <laughs> Happened to you too, Jaded Fairy? Well, darn. And Fall on the Blinks says, no, it's an alpaca. Yep. You're not wrong. Um, anyway, that was a tricky one today. Artiodactyls. There are so many of them. Let's, let's talk about them for a minute, and maybe talk about their fossil history. Artiodactyls. Uh, um, 
Let's see. All 13 ungulate families. Odd and even toad. Let's look at that. Ungulates are a large clade of animals found on every corner of the earth. They're no longer a clade, apparently. Ungulate means having hooves, and animals are split between odd toed individuals, including tapirs and rhinos, and yep. even toed individuals, which include bovids, giraffes, regular deer, mouse deer, and, rather bizarrely, whales, who are the closest extant relatives to the hippopotamus, another ungulate. Yep. Odd toed ungulates are housed within the order Perisodactyla, which contains three families equids, rhinos, yeah. and tapirs. They are characterized by having an odd number Arty of odactyls, most creative pterosaurs. There you go, Steely Dan. Single toe, whereas rhinos and tapirs have three. Hang on, that looked like more than three. Non functional, not weight bearing. Oh, okay. Hmm. Whereas rhinos and tapirs have three. That's a, a tapir uh, limb. Rhinos and mouse deer, yeah, yay for shams. Here, let's let's look at them. Mouse deer. Uh, we'll go from moose to mouse deer. Also known as chevrotains, I think. They're very, very expensive. Very French. Chevrotain. Et what spotted the chevrotin? Javan chevrotin? Et what el chevrotin? Great el oriental chevrotin? Uh, um, they're pretty cool critters. I don't know a lot about them. In fact, let's learn about them right now. Uh, because that would be neat. Oh, here's one from uh, Animal Logic. Oh yeah, these are the guys with the fangs. Cool stuff. This shy miniature mammal has the four stomachs of a hoofed herbivore, the fangs of a vampire, the adorable face of a mouse, <laughs> and one species even swims like a duck. But these squee-inducing sweeties aren't any of those things. They're an ancient creature that hasn't changed much in the past 34 million years. They haven't this changed much externally, chevrotain. maybe. Chevrotin. <laughs> yeah. How many of you here in chat are uh, are not familiar with these creatures? How many of you are encountering this for the first time? Uh, let me know. I'd, I'd be very happy if you are, because uh, an opportunity to introduce such a cool critter to you is uh, that's something to be happy about. And uh, first time, very nice. Breed up, Jody Fish, yay for Shan. Uh, Stavaros, Jody Fish. Uh, Amelia Bedelia, Galara Dragon. Recovering Chemist and La Petite Prince. Schneider85, first and first time message. Is that a Jay Streezy emote? Oh, I like that. Welcome, welcome, Schneider. It's good to have you here. I just learned today, uh, Jay Streezy follows me, apparently. I was looking at some of my stats, and it shows you on Twitch Tracker, and it's like, oh, who are famous streamers that follow the channel? Jay Streezy was maybe the biggest one, which is awesome. Anyway, uh, and it is awesome, Schneider. It's good to have you here. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Let's learn about Chevrotains. Yeah. Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault, and you're watching Animal Life. Mayor Space says, I don't know who that is. Mayor Space, it's Danielle Dufault. She, she, she runs Animal Logic. Here, I'll let her introduce herself again. Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault, and you're See? watching Animal Logic. The Chevrotain <laughs> is the name of the world's smallest ruminants, which belongs to the Trigulidae family. Ruminants are even-toed, hoofed animals. <laughs> there you go, Mayor Space. Stomachs, <laughs> like cows, sheep, bison, deer, and antelopes. Chevrotains have been around for about 34 million years, with the highest number of species existing during the Miocene Epoch, about 11 million years ago. It was during this time that mammals were the newest, hottest creatures on Earth. <laughs> Highlights from the Miocene include the emergence of dogs, bears, saber-toothed cats, and whales, to name a few. Very cool. Dozens of extinct species of chevrotain have been described in northern Pakistan, 
And Nell says, bison. Never heard that pronunciation? I've heard it a lot. It's it's really common in, uh, it seems like in the middle of the country. Like in Montana and the Midwest, uh, I heard people pronounce it bison a lot. I've always said bison, but some people say bison, you know? Yeah. Uh, I hate to be around it if it bit its tongue with those fangs. I know, right, Jody Fish? They probably have adaptations to make that less likely. Japan, Europe and yeah. Africa. Today's yeah. 10 Chevrotin species are the last remnants of these ancient ancestors. Oh. Also known as mouse deer because of their small stature and rodent-like appearance, these super shy creatures are spread across three genera. The six species of the Tragulus genus and the three of the Moshiola genus live in India, Sri Lanka, and Southeast Asia. In Very cool. Here, let's look them up again. So let's see, we've got one species. Uh, with, hang on. Mouse deer. Yeah, there we go. Um, we've got three species. Wait, what? Name some chevrotain. Javan chevrotain, lesser oriental chevrotain. Uh, Tragulus. It's that genus right there. Oh no, these are all in genus Tragulus. And then I guess we have these as well. Uh, Hyamus, Hy Hyamuscus? Hyamuscus aquaticus. And Maschiola, which is the one that she just mentioned there. Very nice. Including Sumatra, Borneo, and Java. Yeah. The water chevrotain is the one exception, the chonkiest of them all. Hmm. This lone member of the oh. honey mosses genus <laughs> measures around 13 inches at the shoulder. And you know what this reminds me of, chat? This reminds me, oh man, of a critter I was looking up today earlier. Actually, this reminds me. It looks very, very, very Eocene. It reminds me of Eohippus. Yeah. Um, these like classic depictions of Eohippus with these spots on them for uh, for camouflage. This is one of the first horses. Eohippus, aka Hyracotherium. Um, that is a lovely one. In fact, I saw this illustration here, or this model right here, and I thought, you know what? That would be really, really cool to have as a 3D print. And so I went and found an Eohippus 3D print. And uh, stumbled across this. So this might be the next big project that I print. Um, let's look at that in 3D here. Yeah. yeah that, that would be really cool because I could print it life size and it wouldn't be very big because they're like they're like this they're the size of a small dog so yeah Captain EO scene there you go HD yeah I have seen Captain EO down in Anaheim but yeah yeah and yeah this is a free file right here that you can download I downloaded this earlier I thought it'd be really neat to have a life size Dawn Horse, Eohippus, right here in the office. So I'm going to be doing that. Um, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. And you can get it in three different poses. That's neat, actually. Yeah. But yeah, what a cute little critter. So, like... Well, actually, no, this is a perissodactyl, so it's not closely related to chevrotains. It's not even an artiodactyl. Horses are odd toed ungulates. But just that idea of it being kind of smallish and you know having spots like this. You know, when I uh when I saw this image right here, I'm like, oh yeah. Reminds me of Eohippus, you know? Yeah. A whopping 15 kilograms. Kind of the size of mini pie. Yeah, Jody Fish. Hefty corgi. Yeah. The water chevrotain is the only species that lives on a completely different continent, making its home in the tropical rainforests of Africa, from huh. Sierra Leone to the Congo. Very cool. Unlike its vegetarian cousins, this species has been known to snack on insects, 
crabs, ah. and even the occasional dead fish or animal that it comes across. Fish or are animal, fish famously animals. skittish, right. which is a great way to escape potential predators when you're just this small. But mm. the water chevrotain has a slightly more elaborate and much wetter escape strategy. <laughs> when startled, the water chevrotain will spring into the closest river and swim underwater to elude any suspected predator, Interesting. which also includes researchers. It can stay submerged for up like to five minutes did. at a time <laughs> and propels itself forward by walking along the river. <laughs> and you see what I mean when I say it looks like Eohippus? Except it's modern. That's so cool. Up to five minutes at a time. Welcome back, Tony's my baby. Hello, it hello. Itself forward by walking yeah. along the riverbed. It will come up for air under the cover of riverbanks and overhanging vegetation to check if the coast is clear. The water chevrotain might be the largest species, but every species of chevrotain is seriously small. The world record for teeniest, tiniest ungulate goes to Tragulus conchil, the lesser Malayan chevrotain. <laughs> the weest I look, look how small it is. Look at it next to those doves. Holy cow. Oh man, that's cool. That's cool. Um. But those claws on the wings are, once again, invaluable. Rosanne, thank you for the 22 months of support right there, Rosanne. I really appreciate that. I really do. How are you doing, by the way? It's good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Marika. Welcome, welcome. And SV Harkin, yeah, they have hooves. They're ungulates. Of course they got hooves. Well, I guess whales don't have hooves anymore, but... Their ancestors did. These guys do. The weest examples of this little cutie weigh in at just under three pounds. Wow. This miniature mouse deer is even the star of a series of fables popular in Indonesia and Malaysia. Oh, I appreciate that, in Rosanne. These stories, Thank you. A clever chevrotain named Sang Kanchil uses his smarts to outwit those who are bigger and stronger. Chevrotains oh. are mostly solitary and very elusive animals adding to their almost mythical status. They huh. really only interact with each other in order to mate and for the occasional squabble over territory. Hmm. Lacking horns or antlers, the males sport tiny fang-like vampiric tusks, <laughs> which are actually elongated canine teeth to assist them in their adorable little territorial battles. Huh. Not much is known about the habits and behaviors of chevrotains in the wild, however. Because they are. Bilby Peck, I so appreciate that, Rosanne. Oh man, we'll talk about elusive, Billies. I mean elusive. When I get that, One that's gonna species, be awesome. The silverback chevrotain went unspotted for almost 30 years. It was finally photographed in the wild for the first time in 2017 in southern. Wow! Holy cow! An animal that's never been photographed alive in the wild. That's 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 pretty cool, actually. Especially for a mammal, you know? Like, especially for an ungulate. It was finally photographed in the wild for the first time in 2017 in southern Vietnam when scientists set up camera traps after receiving some hot tips from locals. Hot tips? These sightings have sparked a push to protect the chevrotain and its habitat. As you may expect, little is known about the reproductive biology of chevrotains, both in the wild and in captivity, where they are difficult to breed. Hmm. To learn more, researchers have even resorted to measuring the hormone levels in the poops of female Java mouse deer to better understand their reproductive physiology. Go, Alex, fix it. Yeah. Now that's what I call <laughs> dedication to this adorable ungulate. Now what should I talk about next? Please let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe. Very cool stuff. I'll give you a link to this video here. Very cool. Maybe we'll watch one more Chevrotain video because they are just such a delight, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and you've been photographed alive in the wild too? You have or have not been, Mayor Space? <laughs> uh, and same body type as a Dictic, which is a teeny antelope. Yeah, Cast a Dreamer. They're probably not super closely related to them. But, um, and there we go. Ooh, we've got one facing off against an eagle here. <laughs>
we'll have to reverse the footage and uh, mute it because it's from National Geographic, which I guess Disney is their parent company now. Anyway, they get really touchy about videos on YouTube. And so this, when this VOD goes up on YouTube later, it'll get nuked for copyright unless we take uh, special measures here. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we call it something like Deer Piglet. Interesting, Marika. Can I can I ask what uh, what language that is that you're talking about? And Hugan says, I wish I had my phone this morning. I was on my way to town and saw a couple ravens fighting up a hawk. Very cool. Very, very cool. Here, let's let's watch that. And whales. This is one of the biggest ones, isn't it? Water Trevor Tan. Look at that. That's so cute. <laughs> oh, German. Gotcha, Marika. Okay, okay. Ooh. Uh oh. Nice. Well, I'd give that dive like a nine. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, they're related to hippos. They're both artiodactyls. She retains like... <laughs> it looks like an ambulocetus there. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I mean, you can... It's 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 easy to see, I guess, how whales evolved from hoofed mammals like this, because there's different kinds of hoofed mammals that are really, really effective swimmers. I mean, for one, you've got hippos, which are whales closest living relatives. Um, and then you've got animals like moose, which are very, very good swimmers. And then you've got chevrotains as well. That is really cool. That's really cool. Oh, boy. Hmm. So the eagles drove the deer into the sea, and that's where Shamu comes from. Probably not exactly mirror space, but, you know, uh, it's interesting to think about. Um, yeah, here, let's find, a, let's find a little video about that, maybe, from PBS Eons. These are always good when we're talking about artiodactyls moving their way into the seas. Take a look at this. And Diagonal, it is very likely that they splice together two more separate sequences to create a story. I was thinking the same exact thing, Diagonal, especially since when they're, um, when it's under the water here. A chevrotain has made a second home for itself. Like, there's clearly a person here with a handheld camera, and, like, the eagle would definitely be able to be like, oh, yeah, there's a dude right there with a the big camera. Um... I'm sure this is probably, like, footage taken over several days, probably. Probably in several different locations. You know? 
But, yeah. Murph says, I'm pretty sure they are both captive animals. It could be. Could be, I suppose. Underwater. In fact, yeah, this looks awful clean right here. This doesn't look like the actual silty bottom of a natural river or, or pond or whatever. And the water's really clear. I betcha this is like it an enclosure somewhere. Bottom, like a little hippo. Maybe. It scrunches down to avoid being lifted by the flow. The way the game has evolved, the most persistent player... Oh, shoot. And I... Ugh. Darn it. I forgot to reverse that and mute it. Hopefully we don't get nuked for that. But, uh... Yeah, anyway. Let's get back to this. Unlike Ambulocetus, it's... Merp. Let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. We know whales as graceful giants. Some are powerful hunters, some are gentle filter feeders, but no matter what they eat or how they live, whales as we know them are bound to the sea. But there was actually a time when whales could turn walk. Turn this down a bit. Yeah. The like tale of whale the evolution whale. is a story about one of the most remarkable transitions in the history of mammals. The fossil record shows how these animals transform from tiny four-legged plant eaters. And that looks kind of vaguely like a chevre taint. It's got a bigger head, presumably because these guys were carnivorous, the ancestors of whales like Indohias here. But uh, but yeah, same kind of idea, right? It's a vaguely similar body shape. No bigger than house cats to the seafaring giants we know today. This change was dramatic and kind of fast. Fossils from over the past 50 million years have revealed whale like animals of all shapes and sizes, each like a piece in the puzzle of whale evolution. Smack in the middle of this amazing transformation is Ambulocetus, a toothy predator the size of a sea lion, and a striking example of a mammal order in transition. Ambulocetus lived about 48 million years ago in what is now northern India and Pakistan, and its uh, full name, Ambulocetus natans, literally cool means the walking, swimming whale. But scientists will tell you that it wasn't really great at either. In the water, it was a powerful swimmer, but not very fast or efficient. On land, it was clumsy too, with legs that splayed out to the sides, a belly that almost dragged on the ground, and a snout that was so long and heavy, it looked like it could barely lift its head. But That's Ambulocetus. Um, here, I'll show you a clip from Walking with Prehistoric Beasts. Let's see... And the quality on this is kind of dog water, because this is from 16 years ago. 144p. We can do a little bit better than that. Um, let's try this one. Ambulocetus. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, Tommy Platicus. Good to see you. Yeah, so they may have been ambush predators like this, kind of like a crocodile. <laughs> that was Eohippus, by the way, early horse. Hyracotherium. Yeah. Neat stuff. And Mayor Space actually asks a phenomenal question here. 
Um, and I'm glad that it's, it's you asking this, Mayor of Space, and not somebody new, because... Sometimes people ask this question in bad faith. Mayor Space wants to know, so how does the species find itself in such an awkward middle ground? Where they're not good at moving in either environment, and how does its how do its descendants live to thrive? So this is an idea that uh, creationists are really big on. Um, let's see. Uh, Well, it's kind of good that this is not showing up in Google Images right now. Um, I think I might actually have a creationist book on my shelf, though, that kind of uh, talks about this concept. Let me grab that. Is it here? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of wild and wacky ideas in this book. Uh, case in point. <laughs> uh, this is not meant to be a joke in this book. So this is whole point of this book is that, oh, evolution is wrong, and dinosaurs didn't evolve, and they actually only lived 6,000 years ago, or more recently than that. And, uh, and, and people fought dinosaurs. That's supposed to be a baryonyx right there. That's supposed to be St. George, like St. George and the Dragon. Anyway. Um, but part of their argument for this is... Right here. Yeah. Yeah. And the text goes, if you ask an evolutionist... Uh, that term. If you ask an evolutionist to describe what dinosaurs evolved from, he wouldn't know how to answer. Uh, no one has ever found a trace of an ancestor for any of the dinosaurs, flying reptiles or marine reptiles. Creationists, of course, believe that God created them just the way they were on Earth. Most creationists don't even believe that, so that's like disingenuous in and of itself. Young Earth creationists, I suppose most of them might believe that. But anyway, so there's this idea like what use is half a wing or what use is half a flipper if a creature isn't particularly good at swimming or flying or something, then how in the world does it survive? How in the world does it it get by in its ecosystem, become successful, and its ancestors kind of take off? And the thing is... Uh, this is kind of a, a fundamental misunderstanding of how the world works and how living animals work. Living animals, right, extinct animals as well, all you gotta be is good enough to survive and pass on your genes to the next generation. And there are a whole score of different creatures today that are good enough to be able to survive without having, like, a perfect... Say if you're an aquatic animal, you're not perfectly streamlined. Maybe you can't breathe underwater. Maybe you're... An excellent example of this would actually be what we were just looking at. Um, the chevrotain. So this is an animal that spends part of its time underwater. It's like one of its primary defensive habits is to dive under the water. And it's going to have a few adaptations for that. But it's not going to be perfect at it, you know? So yeah, yeah. And yet good enough. Exactly, Lenina. Exactly. Yeah. 
I mean, other creatures that are a good example of this, too, would be... Saltwater crocodiles. Or any other kind of crocodile. They're not the fastest animal on land. They can look kind of awkward walking around on land. And they're not perfectly adapted to life in the water, either. But they do a good enough job at both that they're able to survive and thrive. And this is true of pretty much every animal when you think about it. Everything is a work in progress. You know? We as human beings are a work in progress as well. Where, I mean, shoot. We're still kind of new to the whole walking upright game. That's why we have things like bad backs when we get older. That's why we have knee and ankle problems. That's why we have issues with, like, wisdom teeth and stuff like that, because our jaw has shortened when we started walking upright. Our skull is kind of a different shape, held at a different angle to our neck like that. It's not like this anymore. We might have a longer jaw. It's got to be kind of shortened like that. And so sometimes we need to have our wisdom teeth removed because our teeth are just too closely packed within our jaw like that. This is like a huge, huge concept in evolutionary biology is that every creature is a work in progress. Sometimes you can get kind of lucky. Crocodilians are actually a wonderful example of this. Where they're living in an environment that doesn't really change that much. Like, when you're living in a freshwater environment like this, you know, you can pretty much stay the same for a really, really long time. Tens of millions of years. You don't have to change that much. Because they've just kind of come across a body plan that, that works. There's going to be little changes, generation to generation. And fossil crocodiles from 20 million years ago are not identical to modern crocodiles. Certain crocodilians develop different shaped heads and stuff like that for different strategies. So... Alligators, for instance, have got a pretty broad skull. Um, because alligators don't specialize as much in eating fish as crocodiles do. Alligators... Uh, they eat a wide range of different kinds of prey, including a lot of turtles. And so alligators have got these big, blunt teeth at the back of their jaw uh, for cracking open turtle shells. There we go, there's a good example. So their teeth up here, actually still pretty broad, but back here they get rounder and blunter. And I'm not going to show you a video of it, because it's honestly, like, it's upsetting to watch. I think it's sad to watch for the turtles when uh, when an alligator gets a turtle, you know, uh, into the back of its jaw, and it just goes, ah, 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 until it just cracks the turtle open. So that's an example of an adaptation that alligators have evolved in order to be able to better exploit prey in their ecosystem. Crocodiles don't really do that. Alligators do. They crack a lot of turtles open. Um, and they're pretty well suited to their environments, alligators, but they are still kind of a work in progress, you know? What's really cool about whales is that they were able to commit so fully to life in the water that these early, like, early models like this, you know, the, uh, the beta version right here, or the pre-alpha, or whatever you want to call it. Like Ambulocetus, they were good enough at what they did where they were able to just continue along this trajectory. And I'm sure there are lots of different branches that came off of, like, you know, whale ancestors that are just kind of doing their thing and they never became more aquatic. But one lineage did become aquatic enough to become modern whales, which is really cool. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Uh, um... And Mayor Space's alligators eat small dogs? Yeah, that's often true. They, they take what they can get. Yeah. Um, but anyway, a great question, Mayor Space, because this is a really, really important concept to cover. With creatures like Ambulocetus, you know, like we saw in the clip earlier, they're not the best at, at swimming or anything, but they were good enough for the time to the point where they could be 
successful enough to actually leave descendants. Um, but yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting, Gene Wen. I did not hear about that. Yeah, I don't really. I'm usually not really in tune to uh, like news about human evolution and stuff, just because that's it's kind of outside my field. But it's still really interesting, Gene Wen. It's still interesting. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Let's continue. Cetus natans literally means the walking, swimming whale. But scientists will tell you that it wasn't really great at either. In the water, it was a powerful swimmer, but not very fast or efficient. On land, yeah. it was clumsy too, with legs that splayed out to the sides, a belly that almost dragged on the ground, and a snout that was so long and heavy it looked like it could barely lift its head. But it and and maybe we're looking at this animal the wrong way too. You know, maybe. Ambulacetus spent almost all of its time in the water. And so it never really would have had to deal very much with walking around on land. You know, it might already be kind of further along into the aquatic habit than we realize. Um, yeah, yeah. Ambulocetus was perfectly equipped for its environment. It lived in and there you go, Mayor Space, that makes sense. environments yeah. like river deltas, where it lurked in the shallows and grabbed whatever prey that came near its giant snout. Now, if a long aquatic ambush predator sounds kind of familiar, that's because Ambulocetus is basically the mammal version of a crocodile. It lived a lifestyle <laughs> that was a lot like a crocodilian's, ideal a an animal that lives between the land and water. But despite their similarities, crocodiles and whales are not directly related at all. In fact, Nope. The group of mammals yeah. that includes whales and dolphins, known as cetaceans, are so different from other living mammals that it's been hard to figure out what exactly they evolved from. Interestingly, it turns research out it's done Ardudactyls, in both the mammals. field and in the lab revealed some surprises. First, in the 1980s and 90s, a set of genetic studies... Oh, and La Petite Prince Encore says, isn't there a hypothesis that humans have belly muscles and fat like we do because we stayed in long, a long time in lakes for hunting? Anyone know updates about that? That's what's called the aquatic ape hypothesis, and it's not accepted by any scientist. In fact, it wasn't even a scientist who came up with it, I don't think. Here, I'll give you a, give you a link on this. Um, there we go. Yeah. There's a popular fringe theory about human evolution that claims we went through an aquatic phase. And, uh... Yeah. Uh, an idea first widely publicized by, oh, I guess it was by a scientist, but by a marine biologist? That's odd. Alistair Hardy in the 1930s. Uh, its intent is to explain the reason why humans are so different from other great apes. While the other ape species stayed on land and retained their fur, their knuckle walking, and their lean mass, humans became hairless, upright, and fat as an adaptation to being, for some two million years, an aquatic mammal. There's no evidence backing this up. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting to read about, though. And it's, it's maybe a good example of why... It's maybe a good example of, like, how science works. Testing ideas. Just because something might kind of sound convincing, when somebody, like picks the little bits of information that seem to fit with it, and they only tell you that. Like you might do in a TikTok video or something like that. Um, that's not how science works. In science, we try and falsify hypotheses. So, like, we think about, you know, if this idea is true, then what else would we expect? Are those things true? And if they're not, they, the idea is in trouble. Also, we try and falsify the idea. So, like, we say, if that's if this idea is true, then these experiments should not blow up the idea. And if they do blow up the idea, then you have to discard it. You know, you think about how in the world could I possibly be wrong about this? And uh, and you look for those lines of evidence. If they're there, then it's like, oh, shoot. Gotta throw the idea away. You know? But yeah. Yeah. Many find superhumans in Africa. Exactly, La Petite. Exactly. 
Yeah. Uh. But yeah, yeah. And real men grow beards, thank you. Metazoo has been updated. Let's let's do that real quick. Um Yeah. It has been updated. And let's see. Ah, uh, we wasted another guest, though, doing that. Well, that's okay. That's gonna mess with my average. But... That's fine. You know, that's fine. Um, not much we can do about that. But thank you, thank you there, uh... Um... Thank you, Realman. Appreciate that. Yeah... Uh, at least it counts the win and keeps the streak alive. Exactly, Beards. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. That might have otherwise broken our streak, which would be no good. Anyway, let's get back to... Whales. Have revealed some surprises. First, in the 1980s and 90s, a set of genetic studies took sequences of DNA from whales and compared them to the same sequences in other living animals. And these comparisons showed that the cetaceans are actually most closely related to a group known as artiodactyls, hoofed mammals yeah. that includes hippos, pigs, and deer. Then, a number of fossils found a little later seem to support the same conclusion. In 2007, paleontologists in Kashmir, India, found the fossils of a 47 million year old hoofed creature the size of a house cat that they named Indohyus. It turned yep. out that this tiny mammal had a specialized thickened ear bone that, until this discovery, had only been found in whales. The bone, called an involucrum, helps aquatic mammals here underwater, and it shows up even in the earliest cetaceans it also had which shows that critters like indo were already spending a ton of time in the water probably much more than like a chevrotain does there might be another video about this hang on um There was a really nice video from HHMI about whale evolution, but well, let's take a look at this real quick from Insider Science. Whales are the biggest animals of all time. And that might not actually be true. They're certainly not if you go by length. Dinosaurs were much longer than whales. Sauropod dinosaurs got much longer than whales. Um, they weighed a lot more too. If you consider that uh, they actually have to support their weight on land, unlike whales. Whales are essentially weightless in the water. Heavier than elephants, woolly mammoths, and even dinosaurs. Yeah, not true. But they weren't always the titans of the sea. Let's rewind the clock around 50 million years. No, you won't find any whales here. You have to go ashore. There we go. Pacacetus. Yeah. And Celtic Elephant says, have seals convergently evolved a similar bone? They have not. I don't think they have anything similar to an involucrum. Um, they have, like, a totally different system for being able to hear underwater. Because they actually have, uh, well, at least, uh, not phocids, but, um, the, you know, sea lions, eared seals. They've got external flappy ears. So they've got a whole different system than these guys did. The very first whale... This is cool. Oh, I like this. Millions of years clawing its way out of the oceans. But whales took all that effort and threw it out the window. From 50 to 40 million. <laughs> they didn't throw it out the window. They just used it in a different direction. You know, it's like, hey, tetrapods, let's become aquatic again. This has happened again and again and again and again throughout evolution, by the way. There are so many different groups of, of tetrapods, land living vertebrate animals that moved back into the sea. Every single one of these is an example of that. None of these are dinosaurs, by the way. These are all other kinds of marine reptiles. Marine lizards, like these uh, mosasaurs. It's a kind of ocean-going lizard. 
Our ancestors lived on land. The ancestors of Dacosaurus, this marine crocodile, lived on land. But those crocodiles moved back into the sea and traded their limbs for flippers. Same with plesiosaurs, both long-necked and short-necked, as well as the ichthyosaurs, like this ophthalmosaurus here, or this big shonosaurus, or whatever this is right here. Same with the placodonts and the nothosaurs. Uh, and we don't have any uh, thalatosaurs here, do we? Unless this is a thalatosaur. Might be. But they did that too. Each one of these different groups of reptiles also moved back into the sea. Their ancestors lived on land. So yeah. Yeah. And Ungoy says, How do we tell the difference between shared anatomy and convergent evolution? In cases like this, it's easy. Where, like... Because we can actually trace their ancestry back and we can... We can, like, watch them evolve through time. But it becomes trickier. The more closely related two creatures are, the harder it is to tell the difference between convergent evolution and, uh... Uh... And, like, actual... Uh... Homology, you know? Um... Yeah. Convergent evolution, by the way, is... It's like this. A shark, a dolphin, and an ichthyosaur. They all evolve to look very similar, even though they have very different ancestors. So dolphins evolved from ungulates on land, like we're talking about. Ichthyosaurs evolved from lizardy creatures on land. Not lizards, but... A creature that you might think looks similar to a lizard. And sharks evolved from earlier cartilaginous fishes in the ocean. So sharks have never... They never had a land phase. But the dolphin lineage certainly did, and so did ichthyosaurs. Um, the more closely related two creatures are, the more difficult it is to be able to tell um, if those similarities are due to homology. Like, just... They look the same because they are the same. Or convergence, where you evolve similar traits because you're doing, you've got a similar lifestyle. So like sharks, dolphins, ichthyosaurs, they're all swimming through the water. They've got that streamlined shape, they've got a dorsal fin, a tail fluke, pectoral fins. They're kind of steering through the water, that tail for propulsion. Um, this is convergence right here. But, uh, but two kinds of shark are going to look similar to one another because they come from the same ancestor. Like, fairly recently. That's why mako sharks and, and white sharks look pretty similar to one another. It's because not too long ago, they were the same thing. They, their ancestors, you know, were the same critter. And it split. You get white sharks and mako sharks. So, yeah. Yeah. SNL had a land shark. I remember that, Sculpin. Yeah, Jaws 2. I've seen that sketch. That's an old one. It's like one of the first seasons of SNL. Yeah. Anyway. So, Ungoy, that's a great question. And it's... Usually it's easy to tell the difference between shared analogy, what we call homology, and convergent evolution. Um, if the creatures are not closely related. The closer they are, the more difficult it is to tell. Yeah. Homology versus convergent evolution. Um, yeah, let's see here. I don't know if I'm going to find a good graphical representation of this, but, yeah. Well, maybe here. Um, so what you see here is an example of homology. These are the same structures, because these are all mammals, they all share a common ancestor. We've all got, whether we're a human, whether we're a human, a cat, a whale, or a bat, we've all got a humerus, a radius, and ulna. We've got metacarpals and phalanges, and those are the same in all of us. I mean, we've got the same bones, but in a whale, they have evolved... 
these traits to be more convergent with those of, like, a shark. Or an ichthyosaur or something like that. You know? Does that make sense? Wizard of Lizard. <laughs> Doesn't look funny to me. Har har. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Good stuff. Uh, let's get back to our... Whaley whales here. There we go. Years ago, they traded in their forelegs for flippers. In fact, some whales today still have leftover bones of hind legs. Oh, and this goes back into what we were saying. There's so many, like, every creature today is a transitional form. Every creature is a work in progress. Many whales have still got this remnant of their pelvis that they totally don't need anymore. And yet it's still in there. It's a leftover from their evolutionary past. Super cool, right? In fact, some whales today still have leftover bones of yeah, hind like a tailbone. There you go, Red Bull. Yeah. Once submerged, yeah. their weight under gravity no longer mattered. So they could theoretically grow to enormous proportions. Yeah, because they're weightless, and essentially. They did. Today, a blue whale is 10,000 times more massive than the Pachycetus was. But this transformation wasn't as gradual as you might think. In fact, over mm. the next 37 million years or so, whales grew increasingly diverse, but their size remained small. Oh, ho, 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 ho. We used to think this was the case. This has changed as of last summer. We now have a whale from, what, the Oligocene or something? That's, like, super gigantic. It's, like, as big as a... It's like as big as a blue whale. Perucetus is its name. Yeah. No, it oh, it's from the Eocene. What am I even saying? It's it's like one of the it's a super early whale. And it was super super gigantic. Perucetus. Oh, and Nell, there we go. Ah oh, heck, says Nell. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. So this this whole thing about how it you know it took whales a big a long time to get big. Than the Pachycetus was, but this transformation wasn't as gradual as you might think. Yeah, In fact, yeah. Over the next thirty-seven million years or so, whales grew increasingly diverse, but their size remained small. Yeah, now we know that's not true. There were super gigantic whales super early on, which. You know, this is one of those things, I don't, uh, I don't know why paleontologists, why some paleontologists are just in love with this idea that like, oh yeah, you know, body size and animals, you know, it, it only increases very gradually throughout the fossil record. You know, you hear this about tyrannosaurs all the time. It's like, oh, tyrannosaurs took a super long time to get really large. I think so much of that is just sample bias. You know, we just need more fossils. It, we will be continually surprised by, like, how big certain animals get super quickly if there's an open niche, you know? Because there is kind of a general overall trend toward larger size in, in animals, in, in any lineage of, of animals. You know, all other things being equal, there's a general trend toward larger size. We call this Cope's Rule. Um, it's not true in every case, but the general idea is that creatures tend to get larger over time. Lineages of animals tend to get larger over time. Horses are maybe the, the most famous example. They start off really small and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and today horses are bigger than they've ever been. Um, Yeah, same with uh, with hominids for that case. In that case, but yeah. Uh. So yeah, yeah. And uh, Le Petit says we bred horses to be super large too. Yeah, like draft horses. This is it's true. A very costly business nowadays to articulate a dinosaur. God smile. It is a costly business to articulate a dinosaur, and thanks for helping with that, Delta <laughs> Rain. Those five hundred bits there. I appreciate that, Delta. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. By the way, thanks for tolerating my, uh... 
uh, my little spiel in your Discord earlier. And Mary L, thank you for the 100 bits. Thank you very much. That is excellent. Yeah. It's not tolerating I enjoyed it. You were very kind, Delta Rain. I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, I also recognized I made a mistake in there, too. I When I was talking about lungfish, and I said Osteichthians, I should have said... Uh... Oh, wait, no. I was going to say I should have said Actinopterygians, but they're not Rayfin fish. They are just bony fish. I should have said non-tetrapod Osteichthians. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um... But yeah, yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, Cope's rule. Um, it's this general idea that creatures tend Antogeny. to get larger over time. Like lineages of animals will will all other things being equal will tend to increase in size. It's named after American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope. Postulates that population lineages tend to increase in body size over evolutionary time. Yeah. And it it generally holds true, maybe just in the sense that, you know, we still argue about this to this day, paleontologists. It's not super true for every lineage. Um, but generally, as a lineage of living things progresses through time, hopefully they're diversifying as long as they're not going extinct. And as long as you're diversifying and new species are splitting off and evolving, some of them are going to be larger. And so your kind of like average body size will skew larger just because as diversity increases, your average body size is going to increase too. You might have more small guys, but you're also going to have more big guys. And the more big guys tend to skew the average body mass toward the higher end of the spectrum. If that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. And but yeah, but body size is one of those things that seems to be pretty plastic in animals. Individual animals can grow larger or smaller just depending on the availability of resources. And that sort of thing seems to evolve pretty quickly too. So Le Petit is talking about those elephants on uh, Catalina Island off the coast of California. Those dwarf elephants. Yeah, they, uh, those dwarf mammoths, um, you know, they showed up, these pygmy mammoths, they showed up on the Channel Islands off of California, they swam there, and then as sea levels rose, the island shrank, there wasn't as much food there, and there were no big predators around, so they could afford to be smaller. And with smaller elephants, you can have a greater population size in a small area, too. And so they just trended towards smaller size. Body size like that can change pretty quickly, it seems, uh, in evolution. So, here, have we got a little video here? Let's check this out. About 30,000 years ago, right here where you were standing, huge Colombian mammoths roamed. They were as tall as 14 feet high and weighed up to 20,000 pounds. That's like more than three yes, meters tall. Dinosaurs. This low, flat... Four meters tall. Chickens were a lot like little dinosaurs with feathers. I didn't. Until I read a book called The Dinosaur Chicken Conspiracy. But apparently the poultry farmers don't want us to know anything about it. So they've hushed it up. Saronlin. That's almost a year. Almost. Cheers, Saronlin. Thank you, thank you for your ongoing support. It means a lot. The coastal plain was clothed yeah. in parkland vegetation, a rich mosaic of grasses, herbaceous plants, shrubs, and trees. <coughs> Mammoths of this size needed lots of food and water, spending most of every day ranging far distances to fuel their great bulk. Yep. They relied on their exceptional sense of smell to find food. Here on the coastal plain, the mammoths could it's catch charming artwork here. I like it. Of vegetation, since it was already heavily grazed by themselves and by other animals. Hmm. 
probably droughts too. Turning toward the ocean, the hungry mammoths could smell something quite different. Here, the consistent onshore winds carried the aroma of abundant grasses and shrubs from the huge mountainous island of Santa Rosé. It was so alluringly close to them, a mere four to five miles across the sea. It was an easy decision and an easy swim to the island. <laughs> elephants are very good swimmers, actually. Are better suited to water than members of the elephant family, with their long snorkel-like trunks and their buoyant mass that can shed the effects of their ponderous pounds. They move so gracefully in the ocean. Once on the island, the population of mammoths increased in numbers, and eventually, the food supply Snorkel became scarce face. there, too. There you go, cast a dreamer, yeah. yeah. And over time, the thick glaciers and ice sheets that covered Canada and northern Asia began to melt. The level of the sea gradually rose, like stranding the about. mammoths and flooding the lowlands of the island. So it becomes an island chain. The island chain. decreased in size and eventually was split into four separate islands, the ones we know today. With this decrease in island size, the food supply was ever more limited, especially in times of seasonal shortage. The smaller mammoths that could survive with less food were at an advantage. Yep. The absence of predators on the islands also contributed to the downsizing, since large size was no longer needed for predator avoidance and defense. Yep. Thus, natural selection favored smaller mammoths. Within 20,000 years, most stood only five to six feet at the shoulder. Yep. Less than half Small. the height of their mainland ancestors. Chat, do you think that makes it a uh, an oxymoron? I've heard people say that jumbo shrimp is an oxymoron. Would pygmy mammoth be an oxymoron in that sense too? I don't think jumbo shrimp is an oxymoron. Shrimp is not a descriptor of size. It's, you know... I'm sure it's a clade of, of decapod crustacean. But, um... Anyway, what do you think, chat? Weigh in. Uh... These small miniature giant space ants. species. <laughs> That's the Channel Islands Pygmy Man. Yeah. yeah. The replica bones that lie before you are the remains of one of these pygmy mammoths. It roamed the islands, feeding on prehistoric grasses, sharing the space with flightless geese and tiny island foxes. Very cool. Then, about 12,800 years ago, along the northern coast of what we now call Santa Rosa Island, yeah. Yeah. this 50-year-old arthritic male came to the end of his journey. Aww. He lay down on his left side and died. The island went. Mahoodles, thank you for the 100 bits. I'm going to show you a video of a swimming elephant in a minute, too, so hang on. Um, but thank you for those hundred bits, Moo. I really appreciate that. And uh, can we get a shout out for Moo Hoodles, who also does science here on Twitch? Um, it's an honor to share this platform with you, Moo, and uh, keep up the good, uh, good science work, huh? Hands quickly buried his body with sand, his skin still intact. The demise of the rest of the pygmy mammoths would follow. In fact, most of the world's large mammals disappeared from Earth about ten thousand years ago. Probably because of us. Well, the not, not, not because of Twitch.tv, not that us, but because of human overhunting. The yeah. extinction of all these large animals is still uncertain. In 1994, a clue to this mysterious past was discovered. Over time, erosion exposed this ancient animal to the eyes of the modern world. 12,000 years after the pygmy's death, its fully articulated skeleton, whose replica bones lie before you, was discovered and excavated, revealing the world's most complete pygmy mammoth skeleton ever found. Beautiful. You can now discover the pygmy mammoth's past on your own as you explore this interactive CD-ROM. Learn cool intriguing stuff. stories of mammoth origins, how they lived, why they became extinct, the discovery of mammoth fossils, the history of humans and mammoths, and the importance of the Channel Islands and ongoing preservation efforts there. Very cool stuff. You may even find out the answer to the long debated question. Why did the mammoth cross the channel? So click on an icon and take your own journey of discovery. Yeah, good stuff. So this is from the National Park Service. I'll give you a link right here. And uh, I've never actually been to the Channel Islands myself. 
maybe I'll go uh, this next year, or this year, um, on my way back from TwitchCon or something. Who knows? But, uh, cool stuff. Yeah. And for anybody who is watching that and going, elephants don't swim, what are you talking about? Well, just you wait, let me show you. Elephants are actually really good swimmers. Um, take a look at this. So this is an Asian elephant, which is Elephas maximus, is the genus and species name. They're elephants that live in, like, this is a species that lives in Asia, in, like, India, Thailand. Used to live, I think, across China and Vietnam, Laos, etc. It does look like a lovely beach, doesn't it? Holy cow. Any beach with an elephant is a beach I want to visit. <laughs> yeah. So right now just walking across the bottom, but wait till it really gets swimming. Yeah. It's really leisurely there. Just enjoying that feeling of weightlessness, I'm sure. Imagine being as heavy as an elephant. When you dip into the water like this, and you start floating, that's gotta be like magic, you know? Suddenly you don't feel that massive gravitational force weighing you down. You're just buoyant there in the water. That's gotta be an incredible feeling for an elephant. Yeah, take that weight off, exactly. Oh, <laughs> beards, yeah. Yeah. And their trunk does work like a snorkel. Yeah. This one's not really swimming, swimming, I think, because... And if you are on a dump, you are on a dump. Desmo Jackson, hey, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Desmo, there isn't a reference to reference to Desmostylian mammals, is it? Because that would be super cool. You're, I'm sure you're super cool either way. Welcome, Desmo Jackson. Good to have you here. Yeah, can we can we find footage of a wild elephant swimming maybe? Just like swimming wild and free? Um Let's try this. Yeah, there we go. Elephant and baby swimming. And uh Pandarius, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizer. Twitch recommended this channel? That's awesome. We're gonna be joining Science later. Kenji, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It is great to have you here. Holy cow. Yeah. We're going to be joining Science Streams later for a crossover stream. Uh, on Wednesday nights, Belint and I uh, discuss new scientific papers. So, uh, yeah. Stay tuned and we'll, uh, we'll join Belint before too long. It's going to be good. But yeah, yeah. Well, let's continue with our swimming elephant here. Swimming elephants, two of them. There's a baby as well. Oh, and another grown up. Nice. And yeah, see that trunk used as a snorkel like that? Pretty cool. Elephants are, are superb swimmers. Uh, and they can swim... Pretty, uh... Pretty impressive distances. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway. Sentinel. Sentinel's Blade. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Kenji says, what is your favorite dinosaur and why is it Triceratops? Three historic horrors. What's all this archaic and Um Pandarius, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. And no joke, Kenji, Triceratops is one of my very favorite dinosaurs because Well, it is objectively one of the coolest dinosaurs. 
Um, yeah. Because we have so many specimens of it, we can do a lot of cool science with the big sample size that we have of Triceratops. But also, Triceratops has got to be the dinosaur that I've dug dug up the most specimens of. Uh, here's me in about 2013 with uh, a Triceratops specimen from the Yoshi's Trike site. This particular one, MOR specimen 3027, has got the longest brow horns of any Triceratops in the world. I've dug up a lot of Triceratops in my day. Probably like... I don't even know how many. More than a dozen, probably fewer than 50, though, uh, over the years. And, man, they are, uh, they're really cool. Triceratops, we understand better than, than most other dinosaurs. We understand more about Triceratops than almost any other dinosaur. Um, here, to the point where we can even watch them evolve over time. We can't do this for hardly any other di Actually, basically no other dinosaur ever found can we do this for. Um, just at Museum of the Rockies, where I used to work in Montana, we've got over a hundred Triceratops specimens. And with that sheer number of specimens, as long as you've got good stratigraphic data on them, if you know exactly where they're from in the rock record, if you can place them in this, this strat column right here, uh, this is roughly two million years of time that's represented right here across the lower Hell Creek, the middle Hell Creek formation, the upper Hell Creek formation. Each one of these is a different Triceratops nasal horn. And so we can watch the evolution of their nasal horns from near the bottom of the formation about 67 to 68 million years ago up to 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period. When we see that there's an overall trend in the growth of their nasal horns uh, from pretty small toward the bottom to kind of shaped like this halfway up to like this at the top. Um, we really can't do this with any other dinosaur. That makes Triceratops really, really special. And uh, it's a really cool critter. It's one of the reasons I, uh, I love Triceratops so much. Yeah. And Nell says, would Trikes be the Lystrosaurus of their age in the Americas? When I think of Lystrosaurus, I think of of surviving and and spreading, surviving and radiating after a mass extinction event. Triceratops is kind of the opposite. It was massively common. It's the most common dinosaur in the Hell Creek Formation until the asteroid hits, and then they're gone. So they're everywhere before that, and then they completely disappear. So it's almost the inverse of Lystrosaurus in that sense now. Yeah, but I, I like the way you think. But they were everywhere, absolutely. Yeah. You can't swing a live cat in uh, in the Hell Creek Formation without that cat landing on a Triceratops fossil. <laughs> They're everywhere in the Hell Creek. Especially in the upper Hell Creek. Yeah. Ungoy says, how many Triceratops species are there? Uh, two. Um, well... Two are currently recognized. But, uh... If we go to the Wikipedia page, it'll list a bunch of different species of Triceratops that have been named. So right now, there's two species that are considered valid. Triceratops horridus from the lower Hell Creek. That's, uh... That's this guy down here with the small nose horn. And then Triceratops prorsus, right there, with the big nasal horn at the top. There's this... I don't know if we can really call it a species. This is... This, this is like uncharted territory in dinosaur paleontology. If this is one continuous population of these animals changing over time... Can we really give them different species names? If it's essentially just the same species over time, evolving, changing, with no sp splitting or branching? But this one... 
hopefully soon will be named as a new Chrono species. A new species. Intermediate between Prorsus and Hortus. I don't know if... if I don't know if John Scanella is ever going to get around to this. We'll see. Um, I think it totally should be named as a new species with the caveat that, like, this is probably not a splitting event. This is just you have Chrono species and Anagenesis. But anyway, but back in the day, there were something like 20 species of Triceratops that were named. Yeah. Um... So many different names. Triceratops hatcheri, Triceratops obtusus, Triceratops elatus, Triceratops calicornis, Triceratops eurycephalus, Triceratops serratus, and Triceratops uh, flabellatus. Um, it turns out these are probably all just either different ontogenetic stages. Uh, or, you know, different, like, pathological specimens, specimens that were injured or that have been kind of squashed through uh, the fossilization process. Mostly, though, it's what we call ontogeny. So as Triceratops grows and matures, like most dinosaurs, it changed a lot. Ontogeny. To the point where if you were to find a fossil of any one of these different growth stages, you would go, whoa, it looks so different. It must be a new species. Ontogeny. But no, it's just ontogeny. Ontogeny is like the changes that a creature undergoes through its lifespan. Ontogeny. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, what do we call that again? Ontogeny. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, so like growing up, yeah, Kenji, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's not super surprising that dinosaurs changed as they grew. Because, I mean, we change a lot as we grow and mature. Speaking of skulls, here's some human skulls right there baby, a small child, an adolescent, and an adult right here. Some pretty dramatic changes in the proportions and the shape of our eye sockets and everything else. With Triceratops, they changed a lot too. Like, a lot, a lot. This, at my old museum, Museum of the Rockies, is a display of different Triceratops skulls of different growth stages. Man, do they change a lot. It's, uh... It's pretty impressive, actually. Yeah. And Phoenix says, is the Triceratops the species that we know of yet the last the longest through dinosaur time? It's not. No. We really don't have a good sense for how long different dinosaur species lasted, and it's... it's... At a certain point, you gotta realize that, like... Um... that dinosaurs, um, which were on Earth for like 160 million years until that extinction event, they're still around, but birds are the only ones left, that, uh, here, I'm trying to find you a decent dinosaur phylogeny here. That'll work. Yeah. A little rudimentary, but that'll work. Um... We've got these splitting events where, like, one species splits in two and then they evolve parallel to one another. Um, those, you know, you could 100% just call those different species when there's a splitting event. But if there's a, an anagenetic lineage, if there's just one population evolving over time, 
over millions of years without splitting into different species. Can you call them different species? Like, at what point do you draw the line and say, oh yeah, it's a new species right here, but not down here? At what point do you say, oh yeah, the offspring of these parents is a new species, it's a different species from their parents are now? You know, you, you really can't do that. And that's kind of one of the shortcomings of the species idea. You know, I think a lot of people, especially people in the general public, are used to thinking of species as being... as being real in that sense. Species as being like a discrete, concrete thing. And they're really not. Species are kind of squishy. Um... That's one of the reasons why, like, the findings of old Chucky e. D, old Charlie Darwin, why those findings were so shocking at the time, as people thought that species were, like, immutable. They were something, like, created by God, and they always stay the same, because cause that's how it is, dagnabbit. And that's not the case. The more we learn about species, the more we realize that it's kind of a squishy concept, you know? Nature is far more complex and interesting and intricate than these neat little boxes we try and put it into, you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, Dinosaur Dave, yeah, says, in a gradient of light gray to dark gray, at what point does it stop being light gray? I don't get the folks from Pantone on it. Stat. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. And that's a lot of generations, a lot of mutations. Absolutely, Murph. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Nell says, if ligers, tigons, and pizzly bears have taught me anything, it's really impressed to me how malleable species as a concept can be. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, thinking about species when we're talking about evolutionary time is not really super helpful. You gotta think in terms of populations of living things. Sometimes. But yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I'm getting a bunch of cool questions here. Which one do I pick? Shoot. Um, yeah. We're supposed to grow up unless you're a Toys R Us kid. Oh no, Stealing Dan. Now I have that song stuck in my head. Oh, I miss Toys R Us. Didn't that get murdered by, uh, by a private equity firm? Didn't they kill Toys R Us? Uh, poor Jeffrey the Giraffe. He was butchered and devoured by the stockholders. Savages. It's board groups. Um, Freedom Fallout wants to know what goes into picking a site for a dig? Um, that's a great question, Freedom Fallout. That's kind of a different, we're going off in a different direction here, but we can do that. Let's close some of these tabs here. And, uh, here, I think I might have even talked about that during a fieldwork stream. Let's see if we can find that. It would be. One of these. Let's look at Wyoming from this past summer. And. Let's try this one, maybe. Um, um, yeah, that's why you never want it. Like, I've got some plaster in the bottom of this basin right now. Plaster. Do I do any prospecting here? Like stick your hands down in that and keep them there. I don't. Because mm. the heat that results from it curing will burn your flesh off if you're, uh, if it, like, dries around your hands. Try this, maybe? This branch, there's Parasaurolophus right there, kind of a classic duckbill dinosaur. Our dinosaur might be similar to Parasaurolophus, or it might be different. We don't know yet, because we don't have any of the, we haven't really been able to identify any diagnostic skull bits quite yet. But we do have some skull pieces from over there, like that bit of, uh, 
of jawbone that Fisher found. The t there we go. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Claire Burr, thank you for posting that link to the almond formation. If anybody is not, well, if anybody's not familiar with it, nobody's familiar with the almond formation. <laughs> but if you click that link and you go through the list, you won't see like a single named species of dinosaur on there. Um, we've got bits and pieces of things that have been described and stuff that like we've known about for a long time, but it's not actually published properly in the literature. So that's like any dinosaur that you find here is going to be new, most likely. So in this particular case, this summer I was working with Ethan Cowgill and his crew out in western Wyoming near the town of Green River, Wyoming. And uh, we were working in the almond formation, like I said right there. Um, here. So, this is an accumulation of rocks, what we call a geological formation, in uh, western Wyoming in the late Cretaceous period. And Risa Degu, thank you for the raid, welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Uh, Risa Degu was doing something called Agatha Christie Murder on the Orient Express. Wow. That sounds like one of those first-person shooter games, doesn't it? I hope you won, Risa Degu. I hope you got the whole train full of... Uh, bad guys hiding behind glowing red barrels and etc. Um... <laughs> it's like one of one of those video games at the pizza parlor where they've got the plastic guns with the, like, a, a tube going to it. You shoot, shoot, shoot at the screen. I'm assuming that's what it is, except you have to move your way up a train. And, uh, and Agatha Christie is, uh, you might think that she's like a murder mystery author. No, she's actually a, um, uh, a John Wick style action hero. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've never met her in person, Le Petit Prince Encore. I believe she died a long time ago. Yeah. Anyway, that sounds really cool, Risu Dego. And it's good to have you here. I hope you had a good stream. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um, tell me how it went. I want to hear about it. Anyway, I'm trying to answer the question, how do we decide where to dig? How do we decide where to, to go look for fossils? And I can tell you a story of this past summer. So a friend of mine, Ethan Cowgill. Um, here, Ethan... Let me find a clip of him. Um, if I had actually saved my VODs from last year, like I do all the time now, or like Claire does for me, thank you, Claire, then this would be a lot easier to find. But, um... There, let's go back to the beginning and... Here we go. This is one of my first streams from last summer. Yeah, it was cold then. Shoot. Well, uh, it'll take a minute before any before anybody shows up. No, we're here. We're here. Uh, but he really shows up in the chat. Excuse me. But yeah. Okay. Oh, Claire Burr, are you here right now? Claire Burr is one of my. Anyway, um, got to introduce the rest of the crew. Man, YouTube's being real slow today. Just moving like molasses. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, Adam's been just really slow. Really slow. Come on, YouTube. You can do it. You can do it! Mm. Instrumental in making things work today. That supply tent that you see over there was missing a whole bunch of parts, including one of the, like, ribs that it needs to stand up. And Adam, if it starts raining, I'll probably show everybody. 
but he was able to construct one of the ribs out of some two by fours, and uh, <laughs> <was> pretty ingenious. <laughs> pretty so, uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Fisher McDermott. I'm a, a undergraduate lab tech at Ohio University, and I do mostly yeah, uh, for sure. preparation work. Mammal guy of archosaurs, um, including a bunch of crocs and then a prosauropodomorph. Anyway, we're going to get to Ethan, and Ooh, hopefully he'll talk a little that? bit about... I don't, I don't think it's described yet, but Ooh. it's really Jurassic. Very cool. Very, very cool. Secret. Yeah. <laughs> well, nice. Yeah, so we've got a pretty eclectic crew. Nick Longridge is here, too. I'm not sure if he's going to show up on stream. We've had a long day. He might just be resting now. But, uh, yeah, anyway, oh. we're just hanging out. I might grab something. Did I introduce Ethan earlier? Um, we got lots of employees. Oh, goodness. Come on, YouTube. Come on. This is not a local internet issue. I've got gig speed internet here and it's doing just fine. Excellent bitrate. This is totally a YouTube platform yeah. issue. Uh, not the bees says these dudes got some amazing vibes. The dino bros. Not everybody here works on dinosaurs though. Maybe we should go around and like introduce ourselves real quick if you guys are okay with that. Sure. Yeah. Let's do clockwise I guess. So yeah. Quinn? Quinn Hawkins, I think you guys may have saw me on the stream yesterday, I was Quinn the Fossil Man. Yeah, in I'm, chat, yeah. Yeah, I'm from <laughs> Buffalo, New York, and uh, yeah, just came out with Ethan, go look for some Cretaceous fossils and whatnot, yeah. and it's a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Quinn found a turtle today that we're very excited about, so yes. yeah, we'll yeah. talk about that in a bit, probably. Turtle for the ages. Yeah. My name's Ethan, I work at the Utah Geological Survey, and I do a lot of dinosaur digging in the American West. So Ethan is our crew leader here, and we'll be again this next summer, which we're very excited about. Um, we're going to have to find some funds and stuff, but I've got a good feeling about this here. Um, last year, this fieldwork here was almost entirely funded through this community. I want to make that very, very clear here, that this fieldwork would not have happened if it weren't for this paleontologizing Twitch community and the generosity of people in this community. We ran a fundraiser, and holy cow, it was uh, it was pretty awesome. Anyway, Ethan was uh, the brains behind the operation here. He was looking for a place to, you know, find dinosaurs. He wanted to to fill some kind of a gap in our knowledge of Cretaceous dinosaurs in North America, and so he picked this spot, which is it's actually a really cool story. Often with Danny Anduza here. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, and I guess, yeah. Um, I don't know. It'd be nice to, like, make some chapters in this eventually and to talk about almond field work and all of that. But, uh... Oh, here we go. That might do it. Let's do it. Yeah. I'll totally do that, yeah. Yeah. Now, every, all, everything in camp is set up. All the tools are ready. All the supplies are bought. Mm -hmm. So now it's just time to... Get down and dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Do we want to talk about what we found today? Sure. Yeah. So Nick, who's one of the who's a professor, a paleo professor and uh, who's helping us out, out here, he found what may be parts of a ceratopsian dinosaur skull. So Did like turn out to be a ceratopsian. Yeah. Plant eating horned dinosaur closely related to Triceratops. Mm -hmm. But we're like five or six million years older than Triceratops and the horned dinosaur from this place from the rocks of this age does not have a name so it's possible that he found one of the first good specimens or what may turn out to be one of the first good specimens of a new kind of dinosaur yeah we were so. talking all about new dinosaurs from this because there are no dinosaurs named from this formation zero so just about anything that we that we dig up is going to be new just There's... Kishmai, holy cow thank you for the ko-fi support there Hang on, let me let me check on this real quick Um. Holy cow, Kishmai! That is a that's a sizable chunk of change. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you for that. Holy moly! Excellent. I really, really appreciate that, Kishmai. Thank you very, very much. That is substantial. Holy cow! Thank you. Thank you kindly for your generosity for supporting uh, fossil yeah. science here on Twitch. Um, Kishmai says, love what you're doing here. Thank you. My my whole mission is science outreach, and 
Yeah, I... Making a living as a, as a scientist, as a paleontologist nowadays is yeah. kind of difficult. I've been able to, with the help of this community, kind of carve out a niche for myself and actually fund my research and field work and pay the bills through streaming here on Twitch five days a week. And you're helping me do that, Kishmai, so thank you very, very much for that. That is excellent, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. And Kelly Cakes, how are you doing? It is good to have you here. Um, I'm supposed to be answering the question right now, how do we decide where to dig for dinosaurs? And so I was kind of trying to tell the story of this past summer, June of 2023. I was doing field work in western Wyoming near the town of Green River, uh, working in the late Cretaceous Almond Formation. And Ethan was explaining that uh, in these rocks there have never been any dinosaurs named, and so we knew that this was, this is like, you know, it's a new frontier. Any dinosaur or any vertebrate fossil that we find in this environment is going to be new and exciting. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. We were talking all about new dinosaurs from this because there are no dinosaurs named from this formation. Zero. So just about anything that we that we dig up is going to be new. Just There's mm. by no of species that. of any animal of any kind that is known at the species level yeah. from this formation. So no dinosaurs, no turtles, no... Mammals, no birds, no nothing. Before us. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I don't know. Those fishes last a long time. But, they do, yeah. But they haven't been... I don't know. I doubt we'll find a new species of gar or anything, but if we find a gar here, that would be new. Like, Found some fish. New right? from this formation, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the, the, uh, yeah. We got Melvius. Yeah, the bowfin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big bowfin, amid fish with sharp teeth and plates in its skull. Pretty cool little guy. Right. So, anyway, the reason that we're working in this formation is because we realized that, like, anything here is going to be new. And so, sometimes that's the easy part. Well, not the easy part. I don't know. Um, for you, a geologic map of Wyoming. Um, to help illustrate this concept. So, as paleontologists and geologists... We use what we call geological maps a lot in the biz. So this is the state of Wyoming here in the western U.S. And we were kind of over here near the town of Green River. So each of these different colors right here corresponds to a different time. So rocks that were deposited at different times in Earth history are exposed at different layers and are exposed in different places. So if you're looking for Cretaceous rocks from toward the end of the Age of Dinosaurs, those almost universally in geological maps are this kind of greenish color. And so everything that you see in green right here is Cretaceous. And so what we do as paleontologists, if we're looking for a particular kind of dinosaur, or we're looking at like filling in a gap in our knowledge, like uh, for a particular time, we gotta find where those rocks are actually exposed on the surface. And so often we do, well, we go to places that we call badlands. Badlands is kind of a generic term for areas like this where you've got a lot of exposed bedrock. I guess, um, I don't know. The term badlands comes from like, well, you can't use it for farming it's not flat and there's not enough rain to grow crops or anything so these are bad lands but the thing is these are the best lands for finding fossils because there's lots and lots of exposed rock right there on the surface you could just walk over it you don't have to dig the rock is there on the surface and that is how we find the fossils in the first place get your geological maps you figure out where the right age rocks are that you want to look for then you look at maybe topographic maps or Google Earth, figure out where those rocks are exposed. You look at cadastral data too, you gotta figure out the land ownership, make sure you're not tramping over anybody's private land or anything. And then uh, you get your permits together from land agencies like the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management. And uh, 
And you go out and you prospect. Now, do I have a clip explaining what prospecting is? Let's see here. Um, yeah, let's see here. I know we watched this clip the other day, but let's look at it again. This is paleontologist Jim Jensen of Brigham Young University in Utah. He's working in western Colorado in this clip. And he explains a thing or two. These rock saws there. We used rock saws this summer, we never too. never dig until we see dinosaur bone coming out of the ground. Otherwise, we might dig forever and never find a bone. That's really, really important. I think a lot of people think that we just kind of dig in a random spot and hope that we find a dinosaur. That is not how it works. We do what we call prospecting first. You walk along, you look at the ground, you look for little bits of bone that are kind of sticking out, and then you dig in further, and you see if there's more of the critter there. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and firewood was hard to come by out there, Timmer's Crutch. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Sentinel's Blades, do you plan on returning to this dig site to find more dinosaurs your Ceratopsia lived alongside? Yes, and... We're going to try and get, Ethan might already have, actually, an excavation permit for that Ceratopsian site so that we can find more of that Ceratopsia. Um, here. Um, there's our Ceratopsian site here. I could be back in the lab right now writing papers, and part of me wants to be, but I, I do enjoy this. Yeah. I mean, shoot, you don't have anything like this in the UK. This is, uh... Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, this is the, pretty extraordinary to be in a... The are an American original. <laughs> well, maybe Mexican, too, but, like, yeah. uh, they have some, some down there. But, no, this is a this is an American group of dinosaurs. Uh, there's one species that gets over in China, the Sinoceratops. But other than that, these guys are... These guys are, are born and bred in Western North America. Yeah. And this is their origin, and this is where they reach their highest diversity. And you, you can't find them anywhere else. And certainly this subgroup, we... If, if it's a chasmosaur, this is the only place in the world you can find them. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Um, um, makes um, sense from what we found so far. And uh, there it is up there in that big white thing. That is not a gigantic egg or anything. That is a fossil jacket, and I'll be kind of walking you through that in a little bit. So uh, this summer, all we had was a prospecting permit for this particular site. Since this is federal land, public land, it belongs to... We, the people of the United States, and so it must be respected and protected and preserved. And if you want to dig a big giant hole, you got to get proper permits for that. And so we're going back this year with permits, and we're going to see how much more of the Ceratopsian we can get out. Uh, anyway. Come on, play here in Wyoming. The almond formation doesn't... Uh, anyway, yeah, good stuff. So we're here in the late Cretaceous almond formation. So maybe you've heard of the Hell Creek formation or the Morrison formation or maybe the Lance formation Le here Petit Prince. The almond yeah. formation doesn't get nearly as much attention. The name America comes from Amerigo Vespucci, in the almond formation. who was an Italian About 73 seafarer. million years old here in these rocks uh, from kind of the shores of the Western Interior Seaway when there was a shallow tropical sea that cut through the central, uh, the center of the continent of North America, kind of cut the continent in two. So we were basically on the east coast of the Western subcontinent here. So these are... I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that means. Um, let's go back to 90 million years ago here on our beautiful planet Earth. This is what North America looked like at the time. Um, something like this. You know, I guess it just jumps from 90 to 66. So I can't really show you. Let's go back to 90. It's a better approximation. But we're here in Wyoming in this clip. And actually, the seaway was even closer at the time. Um, but it's kind of the east coast of this western part of North America. During the late Cretaceous... North America was split into two subcontinents. Sea levels were super, super high at the time. 
Those that seaway inundated the center of North America. It's called the West, the Western Interior Seaway. And there are all kinds of weird and wondrous creatures that we're swimming through here. Mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and giant sea turtles and all kinds of cool critters that we've got all kinds of wonderful skeletons of. But, uh, yeah, dinosaurs are diversifying like crazy and, you know, evolving, doing their dinosaur thing all throughout here. This western part of North America, this western subcontinent, after it got split in two, we call this Laramidia, and the one to the east we call Appalachia. We don't have very many dinosaur fossils from here, just because these are not particularly good places to find fossils nowadays. There's not a lot of those beautiful badlands, like I was talking about earlier. There's not a lot of exposed rock in here. You know, there's a lot of trees and grass, a lot of Walmart parking lots over here in this part of the world nowadays. Here is where you gotta go for exposed rock in places like Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, North and South Dakota, and Utah. Um, that's why we've got so many dinosaurs from this part of the world is because there's so much beautiful exposed rock right there on the surface. Just there to explore and prospect and dig up. That's why we don't have very many dinosaurs from the East Coast. It's today, it's just... Dinosaurs definitely lived here. It's just not prime fossil hunting territory today. Um, anyway, that's the Wiss. And uh, this was a warm water seaway, Ungoy. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, I'll show you an illustration. Whoop, uh-oh. You okay? Okay, we're okay. Um, here we go. This is a wonderful book by Ray Troll, Planet Ocean. Brad Matson and Ray Troll, rather. Um, but there is a lovely kind of folksy illustration of this. The Niobrara Seaway and the creatures that lived in it. Yeah. Well, here's just some of the mosasaurs, giant marine lizards that lived in this warm, shallow inland sea. Tylosaurus, Clytostes, Platycarpus. All these lived in Kansas. Know your Kansas mosasaurs, bub. Yeah. Now, the illustration I'm trying to find for you is... Well, that's, that's pretty decent. The Great Western Interior Seaway of North America. Yeah, good stuff. Um, yeah, filled with critters like this. Xyphactinus. This huge tarpon-like fish that lived at the time and would have eaten all kinds of other critters. That is to scale. 17 feet long. They got bigger than that, too. I think up to about 20, 23 feet long. It's like 5 meters. Pretty big. Xyphactinus. That's what its head looks like. Yeah. Um, and then where is the... There we go. I like this one a lot. Imagine you were to travel back in time in a rowboat to the Western Interior Seaway. Some of the critters that you might encounter. Pterosaurs like Pteranodon up here. Mosasaurs, these giant ocean-going lizards. Plesiosaurs. This is an elasmosaur with its very long neck. And these cool flightless birds called Hesperornithids. Yeah. Those are the critters that were swimming around in the western interior seaway during the late Cretaceous period. From about 90 million years ago until about 70 million years ago or something like that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and Tarn Peachy, how are you doing? Hope I'm saying your name right. Correct me if I'm not. It's good to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizer. How are things? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. 
And Timmer's Crux says, I wonder if Oregon had a lot of dinosaurs. That's where I'm from. I've seen saber tooth tiger fossils, but no dinosaurs. You've got other cool fossils in Oregon. Not really dinosaurs, though. I'll, I'll elaborate. Um, in Oregon, there were certainly dinosaurs that lived there. I mean, Oregon was underwater for a big part of the Mesozoic, like my home state, California, is. Um, but you did have dinosaurs that lived there. You just don't have a lot of Mesozoic rocks that are available for study. Um, there's more... You know, Oregon has got other strengths, paleontologically. Like, for instance, the John Day fossil beds in, uh, in Oregon. Yeah. In a remote region, 75 miles east of Bend, Oregon, you can travel back in time millions of years by visiting the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. Yeah, you ever been here? Venturing into this vast, arid region of Oregon, you come across a strange yet beautiful landscape. Green rock formations it is gorgeous. tower yeah. over the valley. Colorful red, yellow, and gold hills signal you have entered the Painted Hills unit. So this is in Oligocene, I think? Hills, you Lots of Oreodonts? You can explore over 3,000 acres of breathtaking landscapes. And see what I was talking about? Have very colorful... With the, with the Badlands like this? So it's just beautiful. When you hear Badlands, think best lands. These are the best lands for finding fossils. Because you've just got all this beautiful exposed rock right there on the surface. And you worked there, Pompel, uh, Pompel mode time. Very, very cool. That is awesome. Well, 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 it's great to have you here. Yeah. Um, I've never been to John Day myself, but I've worked on some of these fossils. I've helped curate them. We've got a bunch of these at the Museum of Paleontology, just down the road from me in Berkeley, California, here in the Bay Area. Yeah. Colorful green and pink and white layers of rock here. Were you uh, these are the more recent exposures, so a ranger or something? Pompelmo? years old. Tell me about it. I, I want to hear get about it. A better understanding of what you are seeing wherever you wander, be sure to check out the Sheep Creek unit of the monument. Hmm. Here you'll find the new Thomas Condon Paleontology Center where you can learn Ooh. the geologic story of the entire area. At the center's interpretive museum, you enter a place that will take you Beautiful. on a 55 million year walk through time. The Very vast cool. collection of fossils on oh, display cool, Spartan. were put together mostly oh, that's really by neat. staff paleontologists yeah. who actively work and study on site. Maintenance and conservation. That's awesome, Pompelmo. That's super, super cool. Uh, an incredible well, paleo salute to you, Pompelmo, for your, uh, your work there. Maintaining one of our national treasures here. Super Based cool. Plant super and cool. Animal fossil evidence Large painted murals are used to illustrate the semi-tropical landscape that once existed here some 50 million years ago. Oh, that'd be the plants one. that were here were ago. ferns, um, big, lush, leafy plants, and then there were very large animals who ate those plants, um, animals like brontotheres, which kind yeah. of resemble an elephant except without a trunk. As well as you should go there, Timmer's Crutch. You should go there and tell us how it goes. Tell us, tell us what it's like. Modern day horse. Yeah. The incredible climate change that has taken place is amazing. When you yeah. consider how arid this once tropical environment has become. Just down the road from the museum, you'll find well-maintained hiking trails that take you cool stuff back there the yeah absolutely i believe it distant past 
Yeah, cool stuff. I will give you a link to this video. And uh Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um where were we earlier? We were uh Oh yeah, why don't I get back to this? Um I'm so excited. I just got a text message from Ethan yesterday before stream. And we are set to be back at this place in Wyoming at, like, the beginning of June this year. Like, that's only, like, five months from now. I am super excited. Holy cow. It'd be, like, you know, near-shore environments. It's terrestrial, but, uh, yeah. It'd be, like, deltaic environments, so, like, deltas, rivers. Oh, and Patrick Crusader, uh, I could talk about that for multiple entire streams. Um, that's the thing. They're not really considering heterochrony. So, like, how ontogeny evolves over time. We would expect to find young Taurosaurus from a low down in section. And then if, if we're right about this and there is pedomorphosis going on, then ontogeny. Taurosaurus morphs are going to become less and less common as you move up through section. As this, you know, as this lineage becomes increasingly pedomorphic. But, uh, anyway, that's a discussion for another time. Holy cow. Yeah. It's cool that you're reading about that, though. Absolutely. There's lakes, yeah. streams, that kind of thing. Just right there on the edge of the continent before you get to that, that shallow, warm sea in the middle. It's all kind and uh, Le Petit, what are the large predators of the Triceratops era from the very end of the Cretaceous in North America, the Maastrichtian? Pretty much just T-Rex, on land at least. T-Rex was uh, the big dinosaur predator at the time. There really aren't any other ones, just T-Rex. kinds of different yeah. dinosaurs were living and dying through here and uh, leaving their bones for us to find. The cool thing about the almond formation is that it's so understudied. And so just about anything that we find in here is going to be new, including this dinosaur. Probably going to be new. It'd honestly be very surprising if it were not new, because this is a slice of time and, and place, geographically and uh, temporally. This is all going to be new, so it should be a whole different group of dinosaurs that, uh, uh, that nobody's ever found before. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, good to see everybody. Yeah, what do we think would be close in comparison to Tarzan? That's hard to say. It might be kind of like Anchiceratops, but again, don't quote me on that. We don't know. We won't know until we get this thing into the laboratory, but uh, and you know, get it cleaned and studied. It is actually being cleaned and studied right now as we speak at the museum in Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly. It's traveled all the way from Wyoming to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> where the Carnegie Museum is currently working on it. Um, exciting stuff. Exciting stuff. Ontogeny. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, and thank you, Dr. Tara. Yeah, Paley News New Theropods from... I saw that earlier. Tom Holtz was posting this on Twitter. Um, yeah. And new Stegosaur. That's news to me. must have just dropped today just in the last few hours actually yeah a new stegosaur yen beilong ultimus oh cool oh boy oh boy we'll probably cover this on monday i think after i get access to the paper because i gotta email these authors and see if i can get this paper um, because it's closed access, unfortunately. I don't have access to the Journal of Historical Biology. Um, but cool stuff. Yeah. From the late early Cretaceous, this would be one of the most, one of the youngest of the stegosaurs. One of the most recent in time before they go extinct. This is cool. This is cool. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, oh, and hello, sweetie pie. Hello, hello, sweetie. Hey, you want to come up here? Yeah. Sweetie 
Pie, can I get you a treat? Look. Ooh, you know that sound. Come here. Hey. Let's see if we can get her over here. Come here, sweetie. Hey. smell and you know that sound you gotta come up here if you want it she just loves being stubborn you know cats they're worse than mules you know stubborn stubborn kitty yeah well you gotta come up here I just gotta ignore her and then she'll come over yeah, and Trappy Jenkins, I know there's an arm in front of the camera. I'm trying to prepare for when there's a cat in front of the camera. So I can switch cameras. Oh, oh you should see this chat. She's rearing up her, on her hind legs like a sauropod dinosaur. Super cute. Super cute, sweetie. Well, we'll see if she... Uh... Well, 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 Kraken not stirred. How are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. Oh, and there we go. Hello, sweetie. <laughs> well, Kraken not stirred. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. We are being audited by, uh, by our landlord at the moment. One of our landlords. Sweetie Pie. Hey, look, sweetie. It's right here. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good girl, sweetie. Yeah. And a fluffy ball, how are you doing? We've got a fluffy ball of our own right here. Sweetie Pie. Let me get you another treat. How's that sound? Uh, crack and not stirred. How did your stream go? I hope it was really, really good. Here, have one of those, sweetie. Yeah. If the situation called for still more protection, he simply grew spears which projected from his body armor. And Mark Rides, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It is good to have you here. Yeah. Oh, sweetie pie. <laughs> the world's first armored tank, you might say. And, uh... Tank is completely covered with thin, bony plates. Moyon... Molon's Knight. Molon's Knight, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. This, this is not me talking. Your Honor, I'm not a cat. Um, I'm actually over... over here? Hi, Katie. How are you doing? You raided in just as my landlord raided in, Ms. Sweetie Pie. Look at her. Look at you, Sweetie Pie. Oh, I'm so glad you let me live here, sweetie. Yeah. Oh, and there she goes. Well. Kraken not stirred and raiders, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. That means talking about fossils, talking about fossil science, talking about the history of life on our incredible planet Earth and what it means to all of us. How knowledge of fossil science can enrich our everyday lives and increase our understanding of the world around us. So yeah, would you like to see a quick welcome video? To help introduce you to the channel and, and tell you what this is all about because be happy to play one for you. Give me a one in the chat if you'd like to see a welcome video. Um, and that will call forth our good friend previously recorded, Danny. Um, Alright, we're getting some ones here. We're getting some ones. Nice. Especially from our new folks. This is excellent. Well, some of you who have seen one of the welcome videos before, maybe you haven't seen this one in particular before. Because I've got multiple and I'm working on more. 
Ben, I mean, hang on, goodness. Previously recorded Danny stars in these videos, and he is very eager to take center stage. But he's going to tell you a little bit about who I am, what in the world a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch, and all that good stuff. So without further ado, previously recorded Danny, it's your time. Take it away. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell ya. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. My first week there, I started working in the Paleo Lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> It was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of fieldwork, digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Chasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Chirarchuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended, and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like velociraptors jump. Rocky Optorix's wings and all the kids who want to see him lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. 
That's who I am. That's who I am. Do I am? That's who I am. That's who I am. Do I am? Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to our now three raiders, the three raids, with accompanying raiders, Kraken Not Stirred, Derelict Void, and Casey Snow Arts. The latter two of which, Derelict Void and Casey Snow Art, you raided in during the welcome video. I hope that worked out okay for you. Welcome, welcome back to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's great to have you here. How did your streams go? Tell me. I'd love to hear about it. It's good to have you here. Yeah. And Darius says, glad I found this channel. I'm glad you did too. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Just that good at timing. I know, right, Casey? I've been... I saw your uh, your dinosaur work earlier on uh, on Twitter. Really spent no expense. Nice stuff. Kishmai, nice stuff. And Kishmai, thank you for gifting Pandarius. Thanks to your generosity there, Kishmai, Pandarius will not have to watch any ads, nor will they have to go without these wonderful emotes as well. Should, should I, I, it feels weird calling them wonderful emotes. I made all of these. But, um... Yeah. Uh, enjoy! Pandarius, and thank you, Kishmai, for that support. I really appreciate it. Look, we are now 40% of the way to our sub goal, and we're only like 60% through the week. Oh no, hang on. We're 80%. What did I say 40? I'm at 80% of the way to our sub goal, and we're only 60% through the week. Thank you, Kishmai, for that, that support. I really appreciate it. Math. Yeah, you know, I'm not a mathematician. Darn it, I'm a paleontologist. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, made a bizarre cassowary peacock pachycephalosaur at the end of stream. And I figured it was time to call it. That does... If it was intentional, that sounds like fun. If it wasn't, I'm sure it was still fun. But maybe a bit more unexpected. That sounds cool, Casey Snowart. That sounds cool. Uh... Casey, were you here the other day when we were talking about Dilophosaurus and the, the keratin over the crests and how that was probably part of the respiratory system of the animal and all that? Because if not, I should link you a really, really cool video about this that I think you would like a lot. You were not! Well, well, well. Um, holy cow, are you in for a treat. Holy cow. Um... Yeah, check this out. A Modern Look at Dilophosaurus by Brian Eng. Can't recommend Long this highly enough. before dinosaurs evolved into giants. They started out relatively tiny. Yeah, let's get to Dilophosaurus. And lived in a world with a bizarre diversity of strange creatures. Um, holy cow! Loki 16. Loki, 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 holy moly. 
20 gift subs right there. 20 gift subs. We just got to our sub goal. That is extraordinary. And it's only Wednesday. Thank you so much, Loki. Holy cow, do I appreciate that support. And there's 20 people in chat who are probably jumping up and down right now. Because they just got a gift sub. They won't have to, to worry about any ads for the next 30 days. 20 times 30, that's 600. There's some math for you there, chat. That is 600 ad-free days that you have just awarded to this community through your generosity there, Loki. And that means they'll also get those emotes as well. There's just a small smattering of them. Good stuff. Um, thank you, thank you, Loki. That means a tremendous amount to me. Yeah. And there you go, Mark Rides. That is actually what I was referencing. I don't know a lot about Star Trek, but I know that. Yeah. Guy whose nickname is Bones. I can relate. I work on Bones. Paleontologist. Yeah. Anywho. Thank you, Loki. I really, really appreciate that. That is stellar. It really is. Thank you very, very much. Oof. Good stuff. Good stuff. And now, uh... Yeah, Dilophosaurus. Here. Um... There we go. Yeah... I'll give you a link to this video, a Casey. Scientific description has also affected how Dilophosaurus has been depicted in paleo art and pop culture. Yeah. The fragmentary nature of the known Dilophosaurus skulls led Sam Wells to speculate that Dilophosaurus had a fragile skull and a weak bite. This suggestion led to further speculation that Dilophosaurus must have been a scavenger or a strict fish eater, mm. or that it must have relied on venom to subdue its prey as in Jurassic Park. In order to better understand Dilophosaurus' skull and biology, I collaborated with Adam on creating a rigorous skull reconstruction. The first skull reconstruction of Dilophosaurus to take all of the known skull material into account, while nice also stuff. considering its three-dimensional structure for a living 3D life reconstruction to be featured in the museum exhibit videos at the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site in yeah. St. George, Utah. Awesome. This in-depth analysis of all of the known Dilophosaurus skull material quickly made it clear that all of those earlier speculations about Dilophosaurus's biology are completely unfounded. You want to make it yep. move its jaw for the camera? That's actually a really impressive muscle attachment area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually helped work on this specimen. This is the holotype or paratype. I'm not exactly sure, but... This is like the best Dilophosaurus skull in the entire world, and it's one of only like three. And they're all housed at the University of California Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley. I worked on this when I was in high school. Um, it was kind of in triage at the time in the prep lab there. And uh, yeah, it just... An incredibly delicate specimen, and I was so the lucky to be able to work on this. Or herbivores had as many as two thousand teeth in their jaws at one time. Happiest Kali. Thank you, thank you, Happiest Kali, for the thirty-nine months of support. That's incredible. That's a long time, Happiest Kali. It really is. Um. Holy cow. Uh, anyway, excellent video right here. If anybody is interested in this dinosaur, Dilophosaurus. You probably think you know it from Jurassic Park, but you really don't. I'm here to tell you that the depiction of that animal in that movie... ...is, uh, very misleading. So on the left there, you've got the Jurassic Park Dilophosaurus. And then on the right... ...you've got the actual size of the animal according to the fossils that we have. Yeah. This was a big animal. I mean... 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, if you would like to bring your idea of Dilophosaurus into the 21st century, check out that video that I just posted the link of in chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the irony of the Jurassic Park Dilophosaurus is that it's one of the very few dinosaurs needed to display bright colors. Yeah, Beards, that's a good point, actually. A lot of dinosaurs probably would have been very brightly colored, like... Dilophosaurus. There's Brian Eng's Dilophosaurus right there. You don't evolve big, crazy crests like Dilophosaurus without having some kind of bright, showy coloration, like in this depiction right here. Or there's another really excellent one right there. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite depictions of Dilophosaurus um, is one by Larry Felder in the book In the Presence of Dinosaurs. Let me... Let me show you that. Um, here we go. Yeah, excellent book. Excellent book. In the presence of dinosaurs. Top notch stuff. Um, one of my very favorite books, honestly. The uh, the artwork in this is. Stellar. And it's one of those books that depicts dinosaurs, you know, as they would have actually been in life. Not as monsters or dragons or anything like that, but as... as real animals. Doing their animal thing. Casey Snower, I think you'd also really, really like this book if, uh, if you're not familiar with it. Get yourself a copy of this book. Holy cow. I think you'd love it. Um, but there's the depiction of Dilophosaurus from this book. Yeah. And there, too. This artist, Larry Felder, is actually really prescient in giving this animal feathers at the time. It could very well be that feathers are an ancestral trait among dinosaurs. It's funny, he got the feathers right, but he got the pronated wrists wrong. Um, good instincts here. You know? Good instincts in this artist. Yeah. But, uh... Love some good paleo art? Yeah! This is... Excellent stuff. One of my favorite books. Just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, let's uh, let's put this back on the shelf. Yeah. Anywho. Um. That gives the history of life its very quirky, fortuitous, chancy character. We are literally here only because of the good fortune of dinosaur extinction. Seven months yep. of great streaming. Thank you, Will62. Holy cow, Will62. Thank you, thank you. Let's protect that ongoing support. If they're removed, America loses them forever. And Mark Rides, thank you for that tier one sub right there. That is excellent. That's a first time sub right there, but a recurring sub, and I really appreciate it, Mark Rides. You won't have to watch any ads now for as long as you stay subscribed. You're doing things right. And, well, I don't want to be presumptuous and say you're doing things right, but thank you for your, your support. It's because of recurring subscribers like you that I can do this five days a week. That I can make my living doing this. And it means a tremendous amount to me, Mark Rides. It really does. Thank you, thank you for that. Enjoy the emotes, by the way. Yeah. Um... Good stuff. Yeah. And, whoa, I didn't even see what time it is. Holy cow. Um, we are not going to get to our dinosaur deep dives today. We'll have to try and do some of those tomorrow. Um, I've got to go raid into Cyan streams, but don't go away, chat. This is not the end of the stream. Just moving over to a different channel. 
on Wednesdays, I join up with Science Streams to do kind of a scientist chat. Paleontologist and molecular biologist. And we discuss new scientific papers from both of our disciplines. We have a nice back and forth. It's something I look forward to every week. And, uh... Mark Rides gifted a tier Mark one Rides, thank you for gifting Crack and Not Stirred. I this appreciate that. First gift sub in the I channel. really do. Thank you, thank you. So don't go away. We're going to be joining Cyan Streams here, and it's going to be a ton of fun. So... Let's go ahead and start that up. There's a uh, Deinonychus to run our credits over. And goodness, somebody's at the door. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see. And I'm glad you like those Wednesday crossovers, Tommy Platicus. I do too. Let's do it. Thank you to everybody whose names are showing up here in the in the credits. Subscribers and resubscribers, gifters and followers, followers like you, Muffin Raccoon. Thank you for the follow. It is great to have you here. Again, we are just reading into science streams, and I'm not stopping the stream. We're just moving over to a different channel. I'm going to be on screen with Belint. We're both going to be talking about new scientific papers in his field, molecular biology, insects, arthropods, genetics, epigenetics, etc. And me, dinosaurs, fossils, natural history, evolution. So thank you for everybody who made this possible. Moderators and raiders, followers and chatters, lurkers gifters and subscribers and everybody else I am grateful as always let's go see what science streams is up to and uh, let's go do a, a collab stream over there see you there everybody see you there